Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming today. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Samuel Erlacher, who's an assistant professor at Baylor University. His research focuses on how children allocate energetic resources between growth and immune function. He examines how early life experience and economic development shape lifetime metabolic health. He co-directs the Gary Sake uh, Evolutionary Anthropology Project in Papua New Guinea, and he also co-directs the Schwar Health and Life History Project in Ecuador. Uh, he's published a few dozen papers in OK journals like PNAS and Science and Nature. Um, his research is funded by NSF and Leakey Foundation. And much more importantly than all that, he's actually a really nice guy, a wonderful collaborator, and really fun to hang out with. So <laughs> thanks so much for coming, Sam. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Wow. Thank you, Ben, for the very generous introduction. I don't think my mom even says that kind of stuff about me. <laughs> they live in New York for a few years, too, so I'm not so sure that's true anymore. But, but thanks. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. And I know it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here at ASU in Samware, where so much cool, cutting edge, you know, exciting, any way you want to describe it stuff has been done over the past five years to really promote and to really advance the field of evolutionary medicine. So I'm excited to be here. It's been great conversations so far. And I'm just really looking forward to showing you a little bit of the work that I'm doing in the area of child evolutionary energetics and health. So I'm going to try to cover quite a bit, but I'll make sure that I also leave time for questions because I'm sure there will be some. So I'm sure that I've surprised absolutely no one in this room when I tell you that we're in the midst of a pretty unprecedented global epidemiological and nutrition transition. Right, so rates globally of adult obesity have, have more than tripled over the past 40 years. And today, there are over 2 billion people in the world that are overweight or obese. Uh, so pretty crazy, meaning that they have a BMI of at least 25. Uh, do people know what rates of overweight obesity are here in Arizona? Any guesses? What's, what? No guesses? 40%. Pretty close. So Arizona is actually remarkably representative of the U.S. as a whole. About two-thirds of all adults, about a third of all children are overweight or obese. Uh, this is pretty crazy. And of course, the U.S. has some of the highest rates of obesity in the world. But the overwhelming majority, about two-thirds of all cases actually, now fall in the developing rather than the industrialized world. So not surprisingly, as I'm sure you all know, cardiovascular disease Several other non-communicable diseases, cancers, diabetes, are now some of the leading causes of death in the world. And this is really expected to, to only accelerate globally, particularly in the developing world, where, where it should double probably over this next decade. So it's pretty terrifying, yet despite this global increase in overnutrition in associated chronic diseases, in the places where the burden is supposed to increase the most, in the developing world, lots of things that are associated with undernutrition, like growth stunting, continue to persist at really high levels. So when we look across the globe, about a quarter of all children are classified as growth stunted, meaning that they have a, a height for age that is two standard deviations or more below international growth reference standards. Right? When we look actually in the developing world and at certain countries, those rates are much higher. What I'm showing in this map is, is even in rural areas in many of these countries, these rates are, are over 50%. So this, this dual burden then, or double burden as it's referred to, of both child growth stunting and later life obesity in the developing world really indicates a connection between undernutrition early in life and overnutrition in adulthood. So this, this dual burden is talked about a lot at the, the country level or the national level. But dual burden also exists at the household level and even within individuals, such that individuals that are stunted themselves have a greater risk of being obese as adults. So overnutrition, undernutrition, these things have really been talked about in the past in a very siloed way, as being two completely different problems requiring two completely different solutions. However, I think things like the dual burden are really making it clear that many kinds of malnutrition are actually linked. How do we make sense of this? Uh, clearly, really diverse approaches are needed to solve such complex problems. Right? We need multi-level approaches that can integrate biology and culture and environment and economics, can do all these things, 
However, I think we really need to try, and I think we, as many of us as anthropologists or in evolutionary medicine, need to try to identify those core underlying kind of unifying pathways of disease ideology that can help us understand some of these things. So I, along with several others, would argue that evolutionary energetics is one powerful framework that can help us to do this. So my research in this area really lies at the intersection of the fields of human biology, behavioral ecology, and evolutionary medicine. And my focus is on how we as humans, particularly early in life, during childhood, have evolved to acquire and to spend calories in a manner that maximizes fitness, but also in a manner that ultimately leads to variation in phenotype and disparities in health. So this is, of course, a, a life history perspective. And using little Boygar, one of my, my favorite study participants here as an example, and, and really thinking about her in terms of a living organism with finite energetic resources captured from the environment in discrete competing metabolic demands that are competing for those resources, I'm really interested in the myriad environmental, both social and physical factors that kind of get under her skin impact the way that she uses calories and how this energy allocation pattern affects her development and her susceptibility to disease across life course. So as others here at, at SAM highlight in their own amazing work, this, this evolutionary energetics framework can really help us to understand some of the basic mechanisms of human adaptation via phenotypic and developmental plasticity uh, and the ability of our species to respond flexibly to variable environmental conditions within genetically defined limits. Now, at the health and medicine level, as I've argued, this evolutionary energetics framework can really provide one of those core pathways for us to try to understand things like the obesity epidemic and metabolic disease. So before moving on, uh, why children? Why do I choose to focus my research on kids? Uh, there are a few reasons. You know, they're awesome participants, they're adorable, they're great, you know, all that. Everybody would agree with that. Very selfish. Apart from that, I think there are other really good reasons. The very fact that, that kids are around at all is, is pretty weird, right? So childhood itself is a unique life stage among humans, one that doesn't exist among other extant apes. So this is kind of the classic work on that topic by Barry Bogan and Holly Smith showing the insertion and subsequent expansion of the childhood life stage in the genus Homo. Uh, anthropologists, of course, debate, some of them in this room, why childhood evolved at all. Um, this is a really good question. And at the core of a lot of this debate is this idea of learning, right? Learning during this time how to be a, a successful adult, those foraging skills, those social skills, everything that you need to be a successful adult. And these arguments largely treat childhood kind of as hanging out, almost in energy pause mode, kind of there to absorb it all in and to learn how to be a successful adult. However, it's increasingly recognized that, that childhood itself is a pretty energetically demanding life stage. So, for example, things like brain development entail persistent energy demands during childhood. So this image is taken from a really great paper by Chris Kazawa published a few years ago. What it shows is that brain glucose uptake and associated metabolic costs have their lifetime peak, I think, not during early life when the brain is, is growing most rapidly, not later in life during adulthood when the brain is at its absolute largest size, right, but actually right during childhood when a bunch of important neurodevelopmental things like synaptic pruning are actually taking place. Uh, so this is a pretty energetically challenging life stage then, if we want to think about it that way. And understanding the energetics of childhood could really be important for helping us understand phenotypic plasticity in general, maybe the evolution of the human life stage. So the other thing that I argue is really important in this is to study the energetics of childhood because many lifetime metabolic profiles often emerge during childhood. So I kind of could have chosen many different examples. I think these two are from the famous Fells Longitudinal Growth Study. But what this is showing is that both children who become obese as adults 
in, in children who as adults develop metabolic syndrome start displaying some of those things, that heightened obesity, that, that greater systolic blood pressure during childhood. Right, and I, I could have chosen many other things, insulin sensitivity, physical activity levels, dietary habits, many of these things that are really important for lifetime metabolism, these characteristics are kind of emerging during childhood. So this is often where metabolic trajectories kind of become aligned for the life course. And therefore, we think it's an important life stage to study when we're interested in metabolism across the life. So, okay, I'm going to um, do something unorthodox, completely ruin the surprise for all of you by telling you what I hope your three key take-home points from today are. First, that energy allocation trade-offs involving immune activity are, are critical for understanding child growth faltering and lifetime obesity risk. Okay. Second, that increased energy intake, not decreased energy expenditure, can most directly underlie the global obesity crisis. Nobody's eating cookies, I hope. And third, child energy requirements are poorly estimated by standard prediction equations for, for likely many children living in the non-industrialized world. Okay, so hopefully that has you focused. Now, as I can tell you a, a little bit about some of the things that my colleagues and I are up to. So my research in child energetics, as Ben mentioned, really takes place in two long-term projects that I co-direct with small-scale forager horticulturist populations. So these are the Schwar of Amazonian Ecuador and the, the Gary Sacking of lowland Papua New Guinea. Uh, these are uber interdisciplinary collaborative projects that involve tons of amazing people, and I'm going to try to point some of them out here as we go, but, but no, these are really collaborative projects. Uh, in the field, we're collecting all kinds of nutritional, pathogen, immunological, life history, all kinds of fun data. In the lab, we're mostly measuring metabolic hormones and immune biomarkers. I also now have capabilities for doubly labeled water analysis of total energy expenditure, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. So most of the work that I'm, I'm going to cover today, though, is going to talk about the Schwar. So I want to give you just a little bit of background on them. So the Schwar are a, a relatively large indigenous population of about 50,000 individuals. They live predominantly in, in southeast Amazonian Ecuador. I'm guessing most of you are pretty familiar with the Chamani and some of the other populations that live in this area. So I don't need to go into too much detail, but this is, this is a difficult and often difficult place to live, right? Really high temperatures, really um, intense infectious disease loads. So in a lot of ways, their environment's really similar to that Chimani one. So our project's called the, the Schwar Health and Life History Project. It was founded by Larry Sugiyama almost 15 years ago. It's now co-directed by Melissa Liebert, who's right up the road at NAU, Felicia Marimenos, Josh Snodgrass, and myself have a lot of data at this point, over 7,000 participants. A lot of that's longitudinal. Um, so in many ways, the Schwa are a pretty ideal population for asking questions about evolutionary energetics and, and working with kids. And, and why is that? Well, there are lots of kids. These numbers probably aren't as striking to this audience as they are to many, but a total fertility rate of almost nine. Right? Women are having almost nine kids throughout the course of their lives. So there's a, a lot of willing participants running around. They're also, as a population, pretty fairly genetically homogenous. So we don't do explicit genetics work with the Schwar, um, but we've done a lot of genealogy work showing that the, the relatedness within communities is, is pretty close, and that this population has really just exploded over the past 50 years. So you're starting with a pretty small gene pool. Um, so good genetic homogeneity and also highly variable degrees of market integration, environment, lifestyle. So there's a lot of variation for us to really key on in analyses to try to understand how those environmental factors are influencing the Schwar's lives. So regarding subsistence, the Schwar living in rural areas where I do most of my work continue to practice a mixed subsistence strategy of, of forager horticulturalists. So by far the largest contributor to the diet is this small-scale Swidden horticulture. Uh, so up to 80% of their total number of calories consumed, including things like plantains and sweet manioc, often consumed as, as chicha, right? spit-fermented yucca beer. The schwar also fish and hunt a variety of game to complement this. 
including things like lowland paca, birds using dogs, shotguns, blowguns still. They also forage various wild plant animal species. So we have palm weevils here and chanta, um, peach palm. So kind of showed some diverse food items, but I'd like to point out that the overwhelming majority of the diet come from these low nutrient density garden crops like plantains and manioc. And our work and in that of others suggests that al although this diet appears to meet micronutrient requirements, it likely limits energy, calorie intake, for, particularly for small bodied individuals such as children who just physically can't consume enough food at times to extract the number of calories that they might need when they're sick, for example. So this is something that's been highlighted by, by Darna DeFour to, to probably be a problem throughout Amazonia. So dietary energy constraint is unfortunately accompanied by high rates of infectious disease, parasitic disease. So this is a very abbreviated list. Viruses like dengue, soil transmitted helminths like whipworm. Take home message, the rate of infectious disease is more than four times the Ecuadorian national average, which is much higher than here, of course. And on top of that, most communities lack modern health services, right? Vaccinations are really uncommon. Much of the health care they get might be from our project. Not surprisingly, we're also finding that, especially among adults, and particularly in those communities close to market centers, that obesity is on the rise, right? We're starting to see this. We're starting to see poor measures of cardiometabolic health. These things are clearly burgeoning. So with all that in mind, a few years ago, my colleagues and I decided that we wanted to better understand the evolutionary energetics of child growth. Uh, so we showed that that growth faltering is really rampant. So about half of all Schwar kids are stunted, right? They're growing about a centimeter a year less than those international references throughout childhood. Uh, we also showed that that growth was related to lifestyle and market integration aspects that, that could lead to exposure to pathogens and infection. So for example, we saw kids who were participating more in traditional subsistence activities, likely putting themselves at risk for exposure to wild disease vectors. Uh, those who adopted certain market integration practices, like these latrines, which could be absolutely atrocious, these kids were also shorter. And we knew that these things were linked to pathogen exposure into immune activity. So we did went a little farther, and we, we built on some great work in this area by, by Aaron Blackwell with the Schwar uh, before I arrived. And, and we showed that energetic trade-offs with immune activity seem to be explaining a large amount of variation in Schwar growth. So immune activity diverting energy away, reallocating energy away from growth towards that metabolic task. All right, so how do we do this? Well, like others, uh, we used immune biomarkers measured in, in finger prick, minimally invasive, dried blood spot samples. Uh, but I'd argue that we also did a couple kind of unique and important things. <coughs> so first of all, we measured multiple analytes reflecting different branches of immunity. Now, I'm not going to get into the, the complexity of the human immune system, which we all know is, is very complex. Uh, but we measured four biomarkers that we thought reflected very different things. So these range from those reflecting very acute investment and costly investment in innate immune activity or acute inflammation with CRP that has a time course of days, kind of all the way down to those that we thought reflected more long-term, less expensive energetic investment in adaptive immunity against macroparasites with IgE. Okay, so this figure is kind of another way to show those simplified biomarker characteristics. So the expected magnitude and duration of immune biomarker production, and therefore presumed energy cost, following a, a hypothetical antigen stimulation. Right? So CRP reflecting acute inflammation associated with a very dramatic but, but brief burst of energy use, and so on for the other biomarkers. Everybody got it? Yeah? OK, so if energetic relationships are at play here, we hypothesized that, that these measures of immune activity should map on to very specific impacts on growth, right? So CRP reflecting very acute investment in immune activity should most strongly trade off with growth 
over a similarly short term time frame. IgE reflecting this long, slow drain on immune activity and on resources should impact growth more over these longer time frames. Uh, you know, measuring growth over three months or longer isn't that hard to do by measuring stature, but you can't measure stature reliably enough to actually measure growth over shorter term intervals uh, to get on the same scale as CRP, for example. So to do this, I had to be a little bit creative. This was in, in grad school, and I, I teamed up with some engineers at Harvard, and I built what's called a, a pneumometer, portable pneumometer. So this is a device that very precisely measures the length of the lower leg, right? the distance from, from the heel to the top of the knee. So, so these are used clinically in Europe, largely in England and in Germany, to quickly uh, measure the effects of something on growth. So for example, they're used a lot in trials of inhaled glucocorticoids. So you can assess, assess the impact on growth quickly and remove children or not. Uh, so the portable device that I then built, validated for use with kids both in the US and in Ecuador, has a technical area of measurement such that you can reliably detect growth of the lower leg of 0.36 millimeters or less. There's all kinds of checks that go into this to make sure that you're getting reliable measures. You can do this and therefore you're actually able to measure growth, linear growth, over a one week time frame among the Schwar and in other populations. Okay, so I'm definitely happy to tell you more about the pneumometer. People always have questions about this. Uh, kids love it. The Schwar call it La Montaña Rusa, the roller coaster. Because uh, you sit them down here, you slide them. So I have participants lining up right, around the community to do this. Uh, for now, let's just leave it at. I, I got these measures of growth as well as stature and more traditional measures. Uh, these different immune biomarkers. I collected repeat measures data from 300 kids over a 20-month perspective study period. It's a long time, a lot of work. I'm just going to show you some of it now. But what this actually looks like when we put up here the, the biomarkers that negatively predicted Schwar growth are really close mapping onto those hypothesized time frames of impact. So again, CRP, this very acute burst of energy use, was only associated with reductions in growth over an equal one week time frame. IgE, this long drain, only impacted growth over these longer time frames, and so on for a couple of the others. Um, so really, this pattern with, with pretty large effect sizes then is suggesting pretty strong dose-dependent inverse relationship that is mapping onto time courses, is mapping onto expected magnitudes of energy investment. It's pretty cool, unique evidence, we think, that, that energetic trade-offs are really at play here. Uh, pretty cool, but perhaps the strongest support for trade-offs that we found was the fact that body fat seems to buffer the, the particularly dramatic trade-offs that exist between acute inflammation and short-term growth. So this is showing elevated CRP levels are shown in red. So kids, when CRP was elevated in individuals with relatively low body fat, it's had a huge impact, about a 50% reduction on subsequent growth. That same CRP elevation had, had no detectable impact on growth among kids with relatively higher body fat, really just marginal levels of body fat. Right? Uh, what this suggests and what's in line with life history theory is that those individuals that have sufficient energy reserves right, are able to, to draw upon those reserves, kind of avoid facing trade-offs during these short-term periods of immunological stress. So again, good evidence that, that something energetic is really going on here. Uh, this finding highlights that, that evolutionarily important role of body fat in meeting energy shortfalls among humans, and we wanted to expand that. And one intriguing hypothesis is that this mechanism of fat buffering right, could also underlie some of the physiology of that dual burden of child growth stunting and adult obesity that I mentioned earlier. So not going to explain this in great depth. It's, it's laid out a little better in that paper. But in a nutshell, we've hypothesized that individuals experiencing recurrent inflammation early in life are essentially receiving usually or historically a pretty honest signal of future immunological energy demands, that they're responding plastically and adaptively to preferentially right, modulate their metabolism to put on 
more body fat. Uh, this will, will help them as far as fitness goes and avoiding energy shortfalls in the future. But of course, we all know if a mismatch situation were to come up, for example, with economic development and market integration, this could also lead to obesity if individuals are prone to put on body fat. So this is really an extension of the, the thrifty phenotype hypothesis many of you are probably familiar with, but one that focuses explicitly on recurrent inflammation and trade-offs with growth. So more data are definitely needed, but this is supported by all kinds of little initial things, uh, including the fact that the Schwar bias growth in weight over growth in height, and most of this extra weight growth, if you want to call it that, seems to be deposited as central body fat. And we know that central body fat is really important for fueling things like inflammation. So there's some possible connections here. And the work I'm doing now is looking at some of the potential physiological mediators of this metabolic plasticity. And I'll tell you more about that here in a minute. Okay, so we were happy with how this study turned out. Uh, but it had limitations, certainly. Uh, first and foremost, using biomarkers, we weren't actually measuring how many calories kids were spending in immune activity or in different branches of immune activity, right? We were using these secondary measures to, to infer that. Critically, we also couldn't say anything about variation in total energy expenditure. So variation in this size of this circle that might be driving variation in phenotype in different environments. So this is the, the phenotypic correlation problem. So could just differences in how much energy kids are spending overall be leading to some of these relationships we were seeing? So we wanted to actually measure, not just estimate energy expenditure. It turns out nobody had ever really done this using gold standard methods uh, among children in, in subsistence, so non-industrialized context. It's kind of hard to believe, but turned out to be true. So I teamed up with two absolute rock star collaborators, Herman Ponser, who many of you probably know at Duke, Laura Dugas, who's a great epidemiologist at Loyola Chicago. And together we adapted gold standard measures of total energy expenditure, so TEE, using doubly labeled water, and resting energy expenditure, or REE, using respirometry. Respirometry is pretty straightforward. Maybe you've all heard of it. I mean, in this case, we were using a clinical device to simultaneously measure oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production at rest in kids. And with that, you can calculate how many calories the body is using. You can calculate how many calories people need if they just do absolutely nothing all day, right? Just lie there at rest. So yes, I brought this device out on a canoe. I powered it with solar. I did it all, this clinical device. Um, you know, that was all intrepid, sure. But I also really tried to follow kind of gold standard clinical methodology for collecting these measures. So all kids were measured early morning, rested, fasted state. These measurements took 45 minutes. Um, I measured kids three separate times, spaced one week apart, and averaged those measures. So across the doubly labeled water measurement period. So a lot of things went into this. And the other thing I'll say, you can't really see in this photo, but kids love this. <laughs> I had totally lucked out when I had visited this community a year or so before. I had, had brought some, some books to give to the school that's there. And one of them had astronauts in it and like a kid going to the moon. So they thought they were like astronauts going to the moon. Again, lots of people lining up. So this was a, this was a really fun study for them to participate in. OK, doubly labeled water. Maybe not quite as familiar, but also pretty straightforward. So with this, you're, you're giving individuals a, a known dose, perfectly safe, totally harmless water that contains concentrated heavy hydrogen and oxygen isotopes. So these are isotopes that occur naturally. We just concentrate them so that we can trace them in the lab. So what you do, kids drink this water. It, quickly, these isotopes reach equilibrium in their body. Over time, both the hydrogen and oxygen are lost as body water, right? Sweat, urine. That oxygen, however, is also lost as carbon dioxide. And that is all we really care about because carbon dioxide production is directly related to the number of calories the body is burning in all metabolic tasks, right? So since we have both of these, 
we can easily isolate how many of those oxygen isotopes were just lost as carbon dioxide, and we can calculate total energy expenditure for individuals. So in practice, what this looks like, you, you collect a urine sample from kids before you dose them. You then collect urine samples, in our case, for a two-week study period. You go back in the lab, measure these isotope concentrations, see how quickly both oxygen and hydrogen dissipate, look at the difference in those slopes, and bam, you have what is the gold standard measure of total energy expenditure for individuals living outside of the lab, right, living their everyday lives. So this is pretty cool. And next generation isotope analyzers really only became available about five years ago for us to be able to do this and to actually implement this technology into population-based studies. So Herman was the first to do this. As I mentioned, I now have this device also in my lab at Baylor. So really excited about the potential applications of this. And if you have questions, please talk to me about it afterwards. OK, so a little background. Uh, the standard model in human health and nutrition, that which is endorsed by the WHO and others, is that human total energy expenditure is additive. Right? If you spend more calories on any specific task, and these are extremely simplified right, summary of specific tasks, but if we spend more calories, for example, in immune activity, that should cause a subsequent and equal increase in the total number of calories that we spend every day. That's the model that we use. So more energy spent on physical activity or immune activity, higher total energy expenditure. Uh, the prediction from this, right, is that children living in subsistence-based contexts where they live really physically active lives, when they're facing persistent immune challenges, should spend more calories. Uh, and in fact, this is the basis for understanding the nutrition transition, one of the keys that children living in an industrialized context simply spend fewer calories every day. Right? Therefore, they're going to store more. This is going to lead to obesity. This is you know, a strong argument. However, more and more data, including what I'm going to show you now, suggests that's not really the case. And when we actually measure, instead of estimate as we had been doing using prediction equations largely developed from weird populations, this doesn't really hold up. So as predicted, this is those Schwar data. We, we do find that Schwar living in rural areas, these forager horticulturalists, have significantly elevated resting energy expenditure when we control for body size. So they're spending over 200 calories a day more in this case in that basal metabolism. Data I'm not going to show you is that this is linked to various immune activity measures that we have, such that immune activity differences seem to be explaining a lot of this. We also find that, as predicted, those Schwar forager horticulturalist kids are much more physically active. Right? So here we use accelerometers worn at the hip for the entire two-week study period. We compare this to, to nationally representative samples from the industrialized world. Schwar kids are on average collecting about 25% more activity counts using these. And you can break that up lots of different ways. We have hours and hours and days and days of behavioral observation showing also how physically active these kids are. So however, despite these differences, we find no population difference in the total number of calories that kids are spending every day. Right, so Schwar kids, again shown in red, US, UK kids in blue, of the same body size spend an indistinguishable number of calories overall every day. This is pretty cool. Um, and with new data that we now have from Schwar kids living in an urban area, so in the regional market center of 10,000 people, we actually have even more data. And we actually see this amazingly consistent energetic transition from forager to market integrating to industrialized life ways. Right, one that, that's characterized by absolutely no detectable change in total energy expenditure, <coughs> despite these gradual decreases in resting energy expenditure, again, really closely linked to differences in immune activity. Okay, so no change in TE despite this graded reduction in resting energy expenditure. And this analysis is, of course, much stronger now because we're measuring these things within the same genetically homogenous Schwar population, controlling for lots of things that we weren't, right? Comparing rural living Schwar to US and, and to UK kids. We also have a lot more data that we collected 
at the same time. And just to give you an example, when we look at, I mean, we collected a ton of immune, diet, lifestyle data. When we look at all of these, we can't find evidence of a single one that actually predicts total energy expenditure. Uh, so this, was, this is pretty striking. And what does it all suggest? Well, it suggests that maybe rather than an additive model, we have evidence for a constrained one, right? Evidence that childhood total energy expenditure at the habitual level is constrained within a, a relatively narrow and likely evolved range, right? A range that, that may have evolved to limit the risk of starvation in energy limited populations, like those that characterized most of our evolutionary history. So subsistence populations like the Schwar, those living in other challenging environments don't appear to spend more calories. They just appear to spend calories differently. And this is not the traditional health and medicine way for looking at this problem and for understanding energy needs. But it is one that's supported by, by growing evidence from animal models, from an increasing number of studies with humans. Uh, so many of you probably know Herman's work with the Hadza. Um, there's work from lots of countries now across the world that when you make these comparisons, this really seems to hold true. Right? And among kids, I argue that this framework of constraint it really aligns well with evolutionary life history theory and with some of the patterns that we're seeing with regards to obesity in the chronic disease epidemic. So let's go back to those take-home messages for a minute. So what was it? First, total energy expenditure constraint really implies that, highlights, I should say, the role of underlying energetic trade-offs like those involving immune activity and shaping patterns of child growth and potentially lasting lifetime metabolic health. Right? Growth is really the key in this entire constrained model because growth is the greatest determinant of how many calories an individual needs. Right? What we're seeing here is that body size is the strongest predictor of energy needs. So growth is really our best way to modulate how big we get, how many calories we require in specific environments that vary. So this plasticity and growth we think is really important for this model. So we're now probing these trade-offs with growth in several ways, some of which I mentioned. So for example, we're now looking at the, the physiological pathways that, that underlie some of these trade-offs, including that fat buffering which I mentioned. Won't go into detail, I've already spoken about this with a couple people here, uh, but measuring things like leptin and cortisol and IGF-1 in the, the same blood spots that we'd collected previously, so we have all this overlapping data on individuals. We're also measuring a wider diversity of immune activity to begin to be able to probe this farther and to even look at trade-offs within different branches of immunity, which is something we're really interested in. Uh, I could have probably given my entire talk, and I kind of wish I would have after hearing and speaking with a couple of, of the students earlier today on, on cortisol and on pathways of psychosocial and physiological stress and how that, that fits into this entire framework as a, as a moderator for understanding how kids are spending calories. So we're doing this in both Ecuador with the Schwar and in Papua New Guinea with the Gary Sackang, and we're starting to look at things like, like alloparenting starting to look, get measures of cultural consonants and, and lifestyle incongruity to try to get a better understanding of how different pathways of stress in this kind of cooperative environment that we as humans live within ultimately affects these pathways. Kind of a fun one that I, I mentioned earlier is that we're really also trying to zero in on, on s maybe what is happening biologically that drives this increased propensity and fat deposition that you see among stunted kids. Uh, so this includes following up on some great work from Dan Hoffman at Rutgers and work that he's done with kids living in shanty towns in Brazil to actually collect now longitudinal energetics measures from these Schwar kids um, to see how these early inflammation events and growth stunting might impact fat oxidation. Uh, so the propensity of individuals to store dietary fat when it enters the body versus actually oxidizing and using it. Uh, so we think this is a really important pathway, and I'm working with several people, including Jack Gilbert and Laura Dugas, to also think about 
how the gut microbiome fits in here. Um, not just how it might impact fat oxidation, but how it might impact energy gain. I'm going to play a big part in this. I really, really wanted to show some results from this, but it just, analysis wasn't quite ready for prime time. Uh, but do come to my talk at the APAs in April, because that is, this is what it's going to be about. And I'm really excited about this. Okay, second big take-home point is that it would seem that variation in energy intake, not energy expenditure, most directly underlies long-term energy balance, and therefore the obesity crisis. Right? So to reemphasize, we're talking about long-term right, habitual patterns of energy use with the constrained framework. So if I was to contract a chronic infection or, or if I was to go out and start running five miles every day, starting today, going from my, my current sedentary way of life, right, sitting at a computer all day, I would definitely burn more calories for a while. Right? You can burn more calories any given day. Uh, what we're saying here is, is that what it seems that over time my body would adjust, I'd start spending fewer calories elsewhere, and I'd bring my total activity or total energy expenditure levels kind of back down to that baseline, in my case, sedentary state. Right? So this is, this is a long-term picture of chronic and habitual energy use that we're talking about. So this diminishing effect of exercise on total energy expenditure, for example, is, is increasingly being supported by the literature. I just grabbed one quick thing. This was a meta-analysis that Herman did a couple of years ago now. Uh, what this is showing, so each dot here is a study, right? And these are long-term exercise intervention studies. So this scale is weeks. So this is energy compensation, basically the, uh, the amount of energy that you seem to be making up for in other parts of metabolism. So if we just start exercising and that's expected to increase our total energy expenditure by 200 calories a day, we would have this line of expected weight loss. But in fact, what we see, right, is that over time, individuals are only losing maybe 20% of the amount of weight that they're expected to lose. This kind of got a lot of press talking about the biggest loser study that came out right a couple of years ago. Um, so again, what you're seeing, and look at these time scales, we're talking you now four or five months, something in that range. We see this dissipation where our body seems to eventually reallocate calories and kind of bring things back down in check so we don't overspend for really long periods of time. Okay, so does this mean that exercise is not important for weight management and health? Have to say this every talk, no, <laughs> right? Absolutely not. Exercise matters. Exercise is critical for health in so many different ways, right? Pulmonary, cardiac health. I mean, we're talking about so many different things where it has direct impacts on our ability to live healthy lives. I think, you know, one thing that we've been discussing more and more and we're looking into with some of our data now is this idea that in Western populations, exercise is actually is leading to a trade-off with inflammation in particular and could kind of help explain exercise's impact on driving down chronic inflammation levels here in the U.S. So there might be beneficial trade-offs going on here. Uh, moreover, I think exercise's effect on things like appetite regulation could mean that there is a very you know, indirect but real effect on energy balance. So exercise regulates how much you eat, you know, if we're saying diet is what is important, that could have real, real implications and real significance. But that said, energy intake appears to really be what is potentially most directly important in this model. So in other words, because total energy is, expenditure is constrained, if you increase energy intake, you're just going to move above this for as long as you increase energy intake, right? There, there's no adjustment happening there. So you're really putting yourself at risk for long-term weight gain when you increase your intake. Okay, this is supported, by the way, by data from the Schwar. Could have pulled out a lot of different things, but basically what we see, although those dietary factors, no matter what we looked at, had no impact on total energy expenditure, could not find impacts on schwa growth, or as far as linear growth. What we do see is that many of them have good, strong impacts on things like 
body fat percentage, and even fasting glucose and lipid levels. So this is showing that kids that eat more market food items that are calorie dense have greater body fat levels. They have greater glucose levels too. So diet does really appear to be a primary driver of the kinds of metabolic changes that are happening among the schwa. These, you know, two groups that I mentioned, in these, these schwa living in this market center of about 10,000, almost double the body fat already of these schwa living in more remote rural areas. I mentioned higher glucose and lipid levels. So these changes seem to be happening really fast and they seem to be really dramatic. Uh, it's, it's pretty terrifying <laughs> and sad to work with population, right, and see this happening. We want to try to address it as quickly as we can. I think, you know, clearly better education about, about diet in market integrating context is going to be really important in this. All right, final take on point. So I want to discuss that, that energy constraint implies that child energy requirements may actually often be really poorly estimated by standard prediction equations, like those endorsed by the WHO and the CDC, um, that might miscalculate energy needs for, for kids living in non-industrialized populations. So the, the WHO model, for example, right, is, is additive. You calculate how many calories kids spend every day based on body weight, and then you add 15 to 25% depending on how active they are. Uh, if we take even that low 15% estimate and use it for the schwa, we're estimating, overestimating schwa total energy expenditure by almost 300 calories a day. Right? You can imagine how this air, which is likely similar in many non-industrialized population, could impact the ability of, of health workers, local clinicians, right, to treat individuals at risk for things like obesity and malnutrition. Uh, so this is something we're really trying to get more data on, getting data from the Gary Sacking and elsewhere to be able to support this finding a little more. Okay, similarly, this air in calculating energy expenditure has made its way into some of our dominant models in anthropology, and this really could lead to inaccurate modeling of life history evolution. So if we assume that kids living in forager populations right, cost many more calories than they actually do, this could obviously lead to potential mistakes in understanding how things like alloparenting, pooled energy budgets, longevity, all these different things actually evolved. Right? We need to have the right numbers in those models to be able to understand how these things work. Uh, so this is something that I'm working on pretty actively right now, uh, trying to get out, and we think is really interesting. OK, I'd like to end by just highlighting again how complex this obesity problem is. Right? In the case of the dual burden, we're de dealing simultaneously with both under and overnutrition. And I think it's very clear there is not some magic silver bullet solution, right? Or answer to this problem that is going to solve it all. Uh, however, hopefully I've convinced you that a, a life course evolutionary energetics approach really has the ability to, to transect many of these different levels of analysis to try to get at, at some core pathways. Uh, and that's really, I think, as anthropologists and as you know, evolutionary medicine specialists, kind of what we can do is synthesize a lot of information, come up with, with ways that we can understand things and that we can explain things to others. And hopefully you'd agree that, that this is one potentially good one for coming up with some creative hypotheses and hopefully some practical solutions at some point to reduce this global obesity crisis. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam, for a great talk. Um, have we got time for a, a few quick questions? It can Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. So, hyper simplified, but go you ahead. know, I'm fixated <laughs> on the white box. Yeah. For an obvious reason that it's a mystery box. It's called yep. Other. Can you talk a little bit about you? Just go back. I can. You, you were there. Oh, I'm going to the hopeful answer okay. to your question. But I can so go back. We've got, we've got Other. We, yep. we have uh, immune function and growth and activity, but. <laughs> 
other, I'm wondering what exactly is in other, what do we know about it, and are there components in other that I would call somatic maintenance, like uh, costs of antioxidants, DNA repair, and so on, that could affect lifespan, depending on how much you invest in other? It's possible. Um, you know, generally when we talk about these, these resting energy expenditure measures, we think we're getting a measure of, of basal metabolism in that a lot of these processes would be captured within that. Um, the fact is, and you know, I think I was talking with Angela about this a little bit the other day, is that a lot of these follow circadian patterns. We're measuring resting energy expenditure, you know, in the early morning. There's, we know there are population differences. You know, I've published on this in, in cortisol, for example, diurnal profile rhythms in different populations. I think it's reasonable to expect, and we kind of modeled this in as far as that how can we explain that other in, in our recent paper, that these you know, diurnal patterns may differ between populations, and it could very well be related to processes of somatic maintenance. Absolutely. We can talk more about it. Yeah. A quick one here. Yeah. Um, wonderful results. It's just fabulous to see this work. Um, so we know that in, in inflammatory uh, responses mediate most chronic disease. If you take people in a stable immunologic environment and cut their calorie intake, does that cut the body's investment in immunologic function? Could. You know, I, I think if, you're, if you drop below some kind of you know, bottom range area where you actually have to start making cuts to things, uh, you could start seeing reductions in immune activity. You see suppressed immune activity and malnutrition, for example. You see some of these things. I think how, how I've been thinking about chronic inflammation, for example, in the West, is that one of the really interesting predictions with, with growth here is that immune activity should lead to trade-offs with growth even in environments of nutritional abundance, right? And, and you do in chronic inflammatory diseases, in kids with HIV infection, these chronic infections, you see reduced growth. And actually, most of the evidence suggests, although it's scattered throughout the literature, that you see normal levels for their body size of total energy expenditure, even though you see elevated resting energy expenditure measures. Um, so there is some evidence kind of scattered out there that this is a real thing. And I'm actually starting to try to, to form a project with Fida Baca, who's at Baylor College of Medicine, runs the child nutrition study there, to try to get at some of these questions in kids with chronic inflammatory diseases and growth stunting. It's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just on that, the data on fasting and lifespan shows that if you actually expose the um, rodents to pathogens, you don't actually get the lifespan benefit because there's more infection. So that might be relevant to your point. Um, but thank you for an awesome talk. Um, I, I wanted to push a little bit about whether um, the thrifty phenotype hypothesis is the whole story because we know that a lot of omental fat actually collects around the intestine and has a sort of barrier function in terms of reducing the translocation of bacteria from yeah. the gut. So, so I'm wondering, you know, is it possible that some of the omental obesity might actually be a direct index of the immune function itself? Very cool idea. Uh, very possible. You know, I was... I was speaking with some others today about my increasing interest in digestion and in the gut, not just with my microbiome work that I'm now doing, um, but also with leaky gut syndrome, with environmental enteric disease, which is increasingly becoming recognized as a problem throughout the developing world. Um, so what you're seeing in these cases, right, is that individuals, mostly children, but adults also have this. Have, have guts with, you know, interstitial spaces that are large enough, things are getting out and getting in that shouldn't be. Uh, you have damaged villi and actually poor absorption of nutrients in those guts. Um, and you're seeing this, this chronic intestinal inflammation. We actually just published a paper with the Schwar looking at fecal calprotectin levels um, in this chronic intestinal inflammation with them. Uh, I think it's a really interesting question, and we've been getting at how we could possibly measure you know, some of the, the intestinal anatomy and some of the gut tracts and 
it's, uh, I'd be anxious to hear your thoughts for methodology on how to get at that. Mm -hmm. Really do cool you, question. Do you break it down at all in terms of the different deposition, fat and deposition in different areas? I have, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, like where I had talked about central adiposity yeah. being more common in populations living in the tropics, Jonathan Wells has done a lot of that really good work looking population level fat distributions. Um, and certainly I was collecting, you know, bioimpedance data from all of these kids. So we have segmented body fat deposition levels we'll look at. Yeah. Hi, Sam. Great talk. Uh, I'm really curious about your thoughts on what, um, or if you could say to what extent we know um, about potential differences in sickness behavior between adults and children. Yep. Presumably, sickness behavior is there to, to minimize behavioral activity in part, mm -hmm. um, to be able to have more energy available for immune response. But for children, because they have so many more trade-offs going on, but also more costs that they pay by those constraints, do we know anything about differences um, or specificity of sickness behaviors in childhood? Between children and adults. Yeah. Hmm. I'm, I'm not familiar with that literature. I'm sure that specific question is probably out there. Um, certainly you see all kinds of right, lethargy, anorexia, all these things that accompany sickness. Um, bless you. I think, you know, one of the things I really should have mentioned about that, that first work that I showed showing trade-offs between growth and immune activity is that these are really low levels. Of immune activity. These are not kids that were overtly sick, right? None of them were showing overt symptoms. I was collecting body temperature, orally, doing all this stuff, right? So no overt symptoms uh, suggesting they had lethargy, they had any of these things. Yet even at these, you know, kind of chronic background levels of immune activity, we were seeing these trade-offs. But absolutely, if we're talking the constraint model, right, doesn't preclude you get that acute infection, that's what we see, right? You're, you're inflammation spikes, you spend more calories. Obviously it could be beneficial to kids to not move around as much to conserve in challenging environments. But I don't know the, the adult kid question. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, great talk. talk. I'm just a, kind of curious, yeah. what about um, where the calories come from? Because obviously carbs, fats, mm -hmm. and proteins contribute differently. Yep. So do you think maybe kids are not getting enough fat or protein and maybe too many car carbs and that might be part part of it? Yeah, great, great question. You know, for this talk, I really just focused on the the energy, right? The calorie level. The kinds of data, you know, we're collecting with 24-hour recalls, you know, and doing food frequency questionnaires, models and behavioral observation. We actually have a lot of really good dietary data from these kids. Um, and you know, most of what it suggests is that they don't have specific micro or macronutrient deficiencies necessarily, um, but they are eating this incredibly low nutrient density diet. And you know, I think I've brought this up already to some people here today too. You know, if this is characteristic throughout Amazonia, you know, might we expect there are some intestinal adaptations to that kind of bulky diet? Uh, we know that Amazonian peoples are characterized by kind of barrel-chested, you know, short, stocky physique. Um, you know, maybe there are something, there's some kind of adaptation going on here to actually increase digestive tract length um, to allow individuals to try to, to capitalize on that bulky, very carb-heavy diet that they have. But we need to look into this more, absolutely. We have some of the carb-fat uh, ratio, the respiratory ratios are really good. Exactly, and, and we do, and those respiratory measures were all fasted, but we're using those to look at fat oxidation, right? And that's exactly what we're seeing. And when we, you know, calculate even the doubly labeled water stuff to make those calculations, you need to know what proportion of an individual's diet is carbs to make those calculations correctly. So we have really good data about, you know, what proportion of a diet is coming in from these various factors. And maybe this could be extended to, like, investigating Yeah. Sure, but not very high, high in, say, healthy fats or, or protein. 
Absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. We need to do more work on the specific nutrients. One last quick question. In the Schwar children who exhibit the growth stunting, do you see that persist in adulthood and decre decrease tibial length or stature? Or yeah. do they exhibit catch-up growth once they can start consuming enough bulky food? To Great meet? question. And I mean, are, if they you know, exhibit this detriment to growth on week one, do they grow more on week two? To catch up, you know, there are all these really interesting questions about catch-up growth. So for these kids, I now have kind of a, a cohort uh, that I've been measuring pretty much every year or more, and now have these diverse measures since 2011. Um, so a lot of these kids are now entering or passing through puberty into young adulthood. So the real goal of our project is to use this data to ask exactly those kinds of questions. You know, how do these you know metabolic changes and growth faltering persist? later in life? Very good question. Thank you so much, Sam, for an yep. amazing talk. And if anybody has any additional questions, welcome to join t -Town. Thank you.